And so Dr. Alicia Estrella is our presenter for today, and she is a certified and licensed genetic counselor at Children's Hospital Boston. She works in the neurology department as a genetic counselor clinic coordinator for the neuromuscular team. She's also part of the Division of Genetic and Genomics in the Conco Muscular Dystrophy Research Lab. Uh, Dr. Louis Conco, some of you may know this, was the one that discovered the DMD gene. Um, Ms. Strella earned an MS degree in neuroscience from Boston College and an MS in genetic counseling from Brandeis University. She has worked as both a research and clinical genetic counselor at several institutions and on varied research projects. She has published several papers and enjoys mentoring prospective genetic counseling students. And without further ado, take it away, Alicia. Thank you so much. Um, uh, just uh, to uh, be clear, I have no conflict of interests, and uh, for people who joined on, our learning objectives were to define a bit of the etiology of spinal muscular atrophy, uh, show how understanding that etiology was very important in designing some of the new therapies um, for uh, spinal muscular atrophy, and then um, talking a little bit at the end about how um, these uh, new therapies are really changing the landscape of this disorder uh, going forward. I'm going to take you uh, on a little history lesson. Um, SMA uh, was first described uh, back in the 1800s by two physicians, uh, one in Austria, one in Germany, Dr. Um, Warnig and Dr. Hoffman. And so the classical early onset form of um, spinal muscular atrophy was uh, originally called Warnig-Hoffman disease. Um, that has been replaced by SMA type 1, but you still do hear Warnig-Hoffman disease. Um, and when we think of Warnick-Hoffman disease or SMA type 1, um, this is sort of the classic picture where you have onset uh, within the first six months of life. The children are extremely hypotonic, and you can see this baby here um, is lying with its arms and legs splayed open, kind of in a frog position. Um, they have severe hypotonia and weakness, uh, proximal greater than distal, arms greater than legs. But interestingly, the facial muscles are spared. Uh, when you do reflexes in the lower limbs or the upper limbs, you, you see no reflexes. Um, and when you look at the tongues of these children, uh, something that's very characteristic for spinal muscular atrophy is a fasciculations. Uh, and those are little firings of the nerves under the tongue. Uh, it's been described as looking like a bag of worms. It's very distinctive. Once you see it once, you, you definitely know what it looks like. Other things that we see on this child here is you can see how small his chest is. He has a very small bell-shaped chest. If we were to look at his x-ray of his uh, rib cage, they would all, uh, all the ribs would be uh, smushed down um, in what looks like a closed umbrella fashion. Um, this can cause respiratory compromise and you see his belly is quite large um, and uh, most of these children will have what's called um, belly breathing or um, paradoxical breathing where the belly expands instead of the chest expanding because there's just not enough room. Um, there's usually no CNS symptoms. Uh, when you look at an EMG, it's very characteristic for denervation of the lower motor neurons. The children decline extremely quickly um, and without any intervention, uh, the natural history study for this condition says that children will pass at about 14 months with conservative um, intervention. Usually the that 75 percent of the children uh, pass by around two years. Uh, if you were to um, do extreme measures, uh, we do have a small number of children who can uh, live on uh, uh, older than that. Um, it was shown that uh, there was uh, two more mild types of spinal muscular atrophy, um, uh, SMA type 2, uh, or what they called chronic SMA, was uh, described by several physicians, uh, the most detailed by Dr. Dubowitz um, in the 50s and 60s. Um, and then there was a, uh, a much more milder juvenile onset type of SMA uh, described by Dr. Kugelberg and Wielander and called Kugelberg. Wielander disease. 
even though uh, these were three separate disorders, uh, it was known uh, from autopsies of these children that they were all lower motor neuron um, uh, disorders. Uh, and you can see here, uh, and this is the loss of anterior horn cells and spinal muscular atrophy, um, the control um, uh, picture uh, shows the uh, sort of pink color, um, a, a much larger area than in the SMA uh, side um, uh, versus uh, the purple, the more dark purpley color around. Um, if we go up to higher magnification, um, this is the child with SMA. You can see um, that the dark pink uh, are uh, the in the center of the light pink sections, sorry about the descriptions here, uh, are the motor neurons, and some of them are large because they're being phagocytized. There's not a lot of them. Um, the, the, the dorsal root is very small um, compared to uh, a higher magnification of the, the normal infant, where you can see that um, there's a lot more cells and a lot more area where uh, the, dorsal, the lower, lower motor neurons are. Uh, we do know that it is uh, one of the most common neuromuscular conditions in um, children. It um, is uh, fatal in infants. Uh, the incidence uh, is a, approximately 1 in 1,100. Um, and if you think that we have about 4 million births in the United States, uh, we're looking at um, uh, 400 to 700 births of uh, children with SMA. 58% um, of those children will be type 1s. Um, so we're talking about two to 300 new uh, children born each year uh, with the severe life-threatening form of spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, when we talk about incidence and prevalence uh, of SMA, uh, if you're talking about incidence, as I said, 51% of children born are type 1 or the more most severe type. But if you look at people living with SMA, um, only 12% uh, are type 1 because, as we said, the natural history of the disease is only 14 months uh, and most families uh, don't do extreme measures. Um, they do comfort care for their kids and so uh, the majority of those kids pass and the majority of kids that you see living with SMA are the type 2s um, at this point. In the early 90s, they did linkage analysis and showed that um, all three of these conditions were linked to chromosome 5. So now they started to have an inkling that they were um, one condition, uh, sort of a continuum of one condition. And so they were working on different classification systems. Uh, so they started off trying to use an age of onset classification uh, for type 1, type 2, type 3. Um, but this did not uh, work out very well. Well, because you would have uh, some type twos that had onset uh, less six months, five months, uh, and then you would have some type threes uh, that had onset at a year, but then they were able to walk. Um, so uh, this uh, classification did not really work out well, and they moved to a combination of severity um, and functional assessment combined with uh, the age of onset. And so um, what we currently use is SMA type 1 is the most severe. They're considered non-sitters, meaning that they never gain the ability to sit unassisted. So if you were to take your child and put them um, on um, on a free surface uh, with nothing touching them, uh, they would be able to sit up by themselves for more than 10 seconds. Uh, if they would topple over, then that's considered a non-sitter. Um, type 2 or the intermediate type are considered sitters, and this is a broad uh, variety, a, a broad uh, classification because um, the sitter sometimes sitters uh, can only man able to sit and then sometimes uh, they can manage to crawl and do other things as well um, but usually this is a children who have their onset after six months um, but they never have been able to stand or uh, walk unassisted and so they're considered intermediate or sitters 
And then type three is considered the more mild phenotype, and these are considered walkers. So these are children who at some point uh, are able to pull to stand and actually take steps uh, without holding on to anything. So they have to be independently walking. Um, and so this has been divided up um, into children who have onset under three years, uh, which is a more severe form. And these children usually lose the ability to walk. Um, probably by at least by age 10. And then um, 3B are children who have onset of, of symptoms after age three. And sometimes they do not actually lose the ability to walk until much later in life. About 1995 is when they, uh, and 96 is when they actually discovered uh, the gene uh, that causes a spinal muscular atrophy, all the types. Um, it was uh, termed survival motor neuron one. Um, it was, it's a part of a large inverted duplication on chromosome 5Q uh, and encodes in a, a protein um, that's about 290 amino acids. Uh, it was uh, found in patients with all three conditions, uh, so we know that it was it's um, all the conditions are allelic, and um, interestingly, 95% of the patients all had the exact same uh, genetic change. They all have a homozygous deletion of exon 7 of the SMN1 gene. So if we take a look at this area, uh, it's a very repetitive area. Um, uh, the SMN1 gene uh, has uh, what they call eight exons. Um, the protein uh, that they make, that it's made from an SMN1 um, is uh, called survival motor neuron because they only know that it was important for the survival of motor neurons. Um, it's ubiquitously expressed. Um, you see it in higher levels in brain, spinal cord, kidney, and liver. Uh, there are some expressed in the nucleus, some expressed in the cytoplasm. Um, it, when it's in the nucleus, it's uh, in these gem bodies. Um, and uh, it's been shown that uh, the number of gems correlates inversely with clinical severity. But the function of the protein is still um, under investigation. Um, we do know that uh, it's part of the spliceosome assembly and has to do something with pre-RNA splicing. Um, there's thoughts that it might play a role in transcription um, and axonal trafficking, maintenance of the neuromuscular junction and axonal cone growth. Uh, and reduction in this um, shows altering of uh, splicing of certain genes and uh, transcription levels of other genes. And some newer uh, information has also linked it to uh, function in mitochondria, but it's still a bit controversial uh, what this gene actually, uh, the protein of this gene actually does. So they still didn't have a reason why um, SMA, SMA uh, patients have the three types because in type 1, type 2, and type 3, all patients have the exact same homozygous deletion of exon 7. Uh, so they felt that there has to be some kind of a modifier out there um, showing why uh, they have the same genetic um, deletion but different phenotypes. And so they started studying uh, families who had discordant phenotypes within one family. For example, a family that had one child with type 2 and one child with type 3. And so they were looking at the levels of protein of SMN1 and they noticed that there were different levels in the different patients. So the more SMN1 protein that a person had, the more mild uh, their phenotype was. Um, and they also were able to notice at this time that the SMN2 gene, which we showed that was uh, centromeric to the SMN1 gene, um, was uh, present in multiple copies in different uh, phenotypes of patients. And so they were able to show that the SMN2 gene was a modifier of the SMA phenotype. And so what we learned about the SMN2 gene was that it's almost identical to, X, to the SMN1 gene. There are only five changes of amino acids in the entire gene uh, that make it different from the SMN1 gene. 
uh, one critical uh, change is uh, the creation of an exonic splice silencer at the beginning of Exxon 7, which when SMN2 is transcribed, um, you get exon 7 spliced out the majority of the time and you get a truncated protein that's unstable and degraded. Approximately 3 to 10 percent of the time uh, you get alternative splicing where exon 7 is left in and you do get the SMN1 protein product being made from the SMN2 um, gene and this is why patients uh, have different phenotypes. And so we, we found out that it is an autosomal recessive disorder caused by loss of the SMN1 gene, but retention of the SMN2 gene. And that um, SMA is caused by decreased levels of the SMN protein rather than a loss of the protein altogether. And we were able to show that if you had no SMN protein at all, this would be embryonic lethal. So this was exciting and um, we thought we would be able to use the copy number to help with uh, prognostication for families. And overall, you can use that, um, but it doesn't work out at, at a one to one ratio. So if we take a look at this graph, um, you can see if you're looking at the blue bars, uh, this is uh, patients who have three copies of SMN2. Uh, the majority of people with three copies of SMN2 would have SMA type 2, but there are some that have type 1 and there are some that have type 3. And so this makes it a little bit murky um, diagnosing a patient uh, with the type of SMA, type 1, type 2, or type 3, uh, based on um, a deletion in exon 7, homozygous in the SMN1 gene, and whatever their copy number is. Um, we know this to be a fact because um, uh, when we look at how much protein product is being made from the SMN2 gene, uh, that slide I showed you said about 10%, that can be 3% to 10%. So if you have three copies of the SMN gene making 3%, you have a total of 9% of the protein being made versus uh, having three copies of the SMN2 gene that actually make 10% where you have 30% um, percent of the gene being made. And so um, this is uh, why we see the difference in the phenotypes and we don't actually know why uh, some people have the alternative splice as low as 3% versus as high as 10% naturally occurring. Uh, but we knew that we do know that we see 80% of people with type 1 having one or two copies, 82% having three copies, 96 of type 3s have three or four copies, um, carriers can have zero to three copies, uh, patients uh, who are normal for SMN for SMA uh, have. Uh, two to three copies of SMN1 and zero to three copies of SMN2. And there has been one case report of a patient with five copies of SMN2 and no copies of SMN1 and a normal phenotype. And whether or not there are more people out there like that has, hasn't been studied yet, um, but could be interesting if you're making 50% of uh, the amount of SMN1 protein from your SMN five copies um, that would be the same as being a carrier, which carriers um, don't have any phenotype. We know that it's autosomal recessive inheritance. 95% um, uh, of patients have the homozygous deletion that we see uh, here for um, the autosomal recessive uh, inheritance. Um, Two to five percent of patients, instead of having uh, two deleted exon sevens, will have a compound heterozygote, uh, one deletion of exon seven, and one point mutation, stop codon, um, indel, a small indel on um, uh, the other allele, and so in effect uh, have no SM, SMN1 functioning protein and still give you a phenotype of SMA. Um, 
carriers, 95% uh, of carriers uh, will have uh, a single deletion like we see in the parents uh, here uh, on one allele and the full copy of SMN on the other, other allele. Um, when we see compound heterozygote uh, with a point mutation or a small indel, it can be difficult uh, to ascertain whether or not um, the mutation is in the SMN1 or SMN2 gene. Um, most uh, clinical labs don't make that differentiation for you, um, and it can um, be difficult to find a lab to help you uh, get that answer. When we talk about the 5% of uh, people uh, who are non-carrier parents uh, but still have children uh, with classic SMA where they have uh, two copies uh, a homozygously deleted in exon 7, uh, we know that there are two modalities um, that can have occurred. Well, one is the de novo uh, mutation. We do see that about 2 to 3% of the time uh, that uh, because the SMA uh, the SMN1 and 2 area is highly repetitive. Uh, there can be de novo deletions that occur. So um, a child could inherit one from uh, one parent, the other parent is a non-carrier, and they get their second um, deletion de novo. Um, and then we also see something uh, called the 2-0 genotype, where a person gets uh, their carrier testing done and the carrier testing is looking for how many copies of the SMN gene they have. And so they can't tell the arrangement of the copies. So the carrier testing cannot tell the difference between two copies of SMN in trans and two copies of SMN1 in cis, which is what we see here. And so we can see parents who have two copies of the SMN1 gene on one allele and none on the other. So this would be called the 2-0 arrangement. They have two copies, so they are non carriers, but when they pass on um, their chromosomes to their children, they have one copy that's null, and so that's like them having a, a deletion, and uh, their children can then go on to have uh, SMA. It's actually very difficult to find a lab that will help you discern whether or not your family has a 2-0 genotype or um, they have inherited the uh, mutation de novo. One way to do this is to try to look back in the family tree because frequently when you see the 2-0 genotype, you'll see other people in the family who have three copies of SMN1, and that's a clue that you're looking at a family with a 2-0 gen genotype. So we know the carrier frequency of um, 5Q SMA is relatively high in the general population. Um, we see it uh, in most populations. Um, uh, it's estimated that there are approximately 6 million carriers in the U.S. Um, it's second, uh, it, it's uh, in common to cystic fibrosis and um, has been, um, uh, postulated over time, why is the carrier frequency so high, um, especially when the majority of babies that are born are type 1s um, and they don't uh, live to reproduce. And so there's been the theory uh, put out there that the carriers have some kind of um, an advantage um, uh, similar to uh, carriers of sickle cell who uh, are resistant to malaria. Um, this heterozygous advantage uh, must be there to keep the carrier frequency so high. To date, nobody's been able to identify that, but it is something that um, is uh, frequently postulated with looking at the high carrier frequency. So we're going to move on to um, therapies uh, in spinal muscular atrophy. Um, when we look uh, at um, ideas for uh, coming up with therapies, um, majority of successful things have been to either increase uh, the full length protein uh, from either SM N2 or replace the uh, SMN1 gene. Um, because all the patients have the same uh, defect, it's made a very clear target and an easy, what we call translational disease, to be able to come up with ideas um, to, um, to fix that in families. So, uh, 
there are a lot of avenues of um, study right now for um, different strategies uh, to try to um, treat SMA. Um, we're going to talk to you about the two uh, therapies that actually have had things approved by the FDA. So we're talking about number four, I'm sorry, uh, number five, a replacement of the SMN1 gene with gene therapy, and number six, uh, antisense oligonucleotides. We'll go on to touch base on a couple of other uh, therapies uh, that are still in clinical trials but are looking very promising. Um, so when we talk about the antisense uh, oligonucleotide therapy, um, this is uh, uses a target to try to get the SMN2 splicing upregulated. We know that it happens naturally, but how can we make it happen uh, higher, higher levels so that we get enough SMN1 protein made from the SMN2 gene to um, fix the phenotype? And so they started uh, doing this in um, animal models. Um, they were able to knock out um, SMN in mice, uh, introduce a number of SMN2 copies, and then upregulate and show proof of concept that they were able to um, get uh, the SMN1 protein made and ameliorate uh, the phenotype. Uh, so the first um, uh, ASO to come to market is one um, called Nusinersen. Um, it uh, corrects the SMN2 uh, splicing um, it actually modulates the splicing and allows the alternative to splice so that the SMN2 gene is making the functional uh, protein. It was tested in the mouse model um, and shown uh, when you gave it uh, intravenously throughout the body to be able to uh, change the phenotype. Um, and then uh, we also went on to try it in monkeys uh, where they had an intrathecal delivery where it stayed in the central nervous system and also also was able to ameliorate symptoms in, monk in monkeys. And so um, these uh, studies were done by Hua et al. and Passini et al. and sort of were the proof of concept of this moving on uh, towards um, human trials. Um, so uh, a study, a company called um, originally ISIS, but due to pressure of the negative connotations, they changed their name to Ionis, uh, started uh, the ASO trials. Um, we at Children's Hospital joined in at about in 2011 uh, in the phase three studies. Uh, we had children in type one infants in the NDEER study where they were looking at children less than seven months. They were randomized two to one. So every third child that was enrolled in the study did not get drug. Um, and also the CHERISH study, which was also a phase three. It was looking at type two, uh, uh, older children from age two to 12. And again, um, it was randomized in two to one and every third child participating did not get drug. Both trials had uh, an interim eval, one at 13 months, one at 15 months. And it became very clear that all the children who were not on drug were declining. Um, some had passed in the infant study um, versus all of the children who were on drug. Um, uh, we used um, methods like the chop and tend and the hammersmith uh, to measure motor milestones were gaining motor milestones. And so um, these trials were stopped, they were unblinded, and then all of the children were put in either CS11 or CS12, which was considered an open label, and they all were getting drug while remaining in the study to be able to um, still uh, gain data. Um, about 2015, uh, the IONIS uh, was bought out by Biogen. They started um, a hallmark study called Nurture, where it was looking at pre-symptomatic children. And so this was 17 children that were identified either prenatally or diagnosed right at birth. Um, they had uh, two or three copies of SMN2, and they were treated within the first month of life. Um, and those children did exceedingly well, and most of them uh, were uh, meeting uh, almost normal milestones. And so with those studies under its belt, the FDA um, the, uh, 
Biogen went to the FDA um, and uh, had Spinraza, Nusinersen or Spinraza as the drug is called, approved in December of 2016. Um, it is was approved as an intrathecal administration. 98% um, of the drug stays in the spinal column, only 2% of the drug goes into the systemic um, and this was um, one of the reasons why the side effect profile of this uh, condition of this treatment is so good uh, because the majority of the drug stays in the spinal column and doesn't go throughout the body. Uh, the main, um, the main uh, side effect that we see in, in families is the LP headache or leaks uh, that can occur after repeated intrathecal injections. Um, everybody and of every type and age is diagnosed is uh, dosed the same. Um, they get four loading doses uh, day one, 15, 29, 60, and then every four months is the maintenance doses. Uh, things that we look for are thrombocytopenia that was seen in about 11% of patients um, in the trials. Um, other types of treatments. Um, with ASOs uh, have shown proteinuria. Um, and so because the ASOs are excreted via the kidney, we do watch for that in patients. And then I would say about a year after Spinraza was uh, approved, uh, we got a report saying that five children had been diagnosed with hydrocephalus of about 5,000 treated children. Um, and uh, so we had to start uh, measuring head size uh, when we saw the children in clinic once every six months or once every year, um, uh, although the incidence in the general population is about one in a thousand, so it's a little bit controversial. Um, we uh, see children um, of all ages and types of SMA at Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, we actually do the intrathecal injection for younger children, but at some point, uh, older children may have to have spinal fusion, and then you have no way to get into the spine. So we did devise a port system uh, where they have a catheter that goes into the spinal column, and uh, you don't need to actually do the intrathecal injections, you just inject in a port under the skin. Um, we're following more than 100 patients, but at least 100. And um, I would say probably all the patients, even a later onset or more severe onset, older patients uh, report some benefit. Uh, clearly, children who are dosed earlier have more benefit. Um, and we have noticed that there's a, a big time dependency, that the longer on the drug, the, the better that you do, the more uh, milestones that you do gain. Um, this uh, little girl here is uh, Sophia. She is on the brochure for um, for Spinraza for Biogen, which is why this is a picture from that brochure, which is why I can show it to you. Um, we met her at five months of age. Uh, she had no anti-gravity movements in her lower limbs. She could wiggle her toes. She could only bend her uh, arms at the elbow, not at the shoulder. Um, she uh, went into the Endear trial. Uh, she started Spinraza at about six months of age. Um, and here you can see her at age two and a half, uh, where she's standing on her own. Um, she can pull to stand, and at this time she could cruise around the furniture in her house uh, all on her own. Um, she does still have scoliosis. You see her wearing a back brace, uh, and she does uh, still have difficulty with swallowing, so she eats most of her food uh, via G-tube, uh, but um, she's now four years old and still doing great talking, going to school, walking on her own, um, you know, compared to 14 months uh, of a type one uh, SMA. Oops, sorry. Um, uh, Although many of our patients are doing very well on Spinraza, we do still have a lot of unknown things about Spinraza. Um, a child uh, or an infant and a 20-year-old person, they get the same exact uh, amount of Spinraza. Um, should older people get higher doses? Uh, some of our patients who are type threes uh, report a waning of, of um, abilities right before they're due for their next dose, and then they sort of get bolstered by the next dose um, because they're more mobile and active. Does that mean that they would require more frequent doses 
or higher doses. Um, these are things that are still unknowns in that we still need some uh, clinical trials to be able to answer questions like that. Um, we do know that the drug is very expensive. Um, people do not love having repeated LPs. Um, and we do have to get uh, use a lot of labor to get it covered by insurance. Um, and uh, these are all things that are um, still up in the air of what's going to happen uh, down the road as we continue to treat children with spinraza. The other um, type of therapy that has um, really come to market is gene replacement therapy uh, and Faust. Uh, at all um, was sort of the hallmark paper or the proof of concept for this, where he showed that using the AAV9 vector, he was able to replace the SMN1 gene in a mouse model of spinal muscular atrophy. And so if you look in um, A, where the uh, spinal column is shown, you can see those boxes of red. Um, that's showing that the SMN1 uh, gene was able to be um, transduced and turned on in um, the spinal column, uh, in the dorsal root ganglia, in the motor, mo motor neurons. Um, if you look at E, you can see their survival. Uh, you can see that mice with the SMA phenotype die around 15 days. Uh, with the transgene, they were able to live just about a normal life expectancy of about 200 to 225 days. Um, if you look at the pictures of the mice, you can see that the uh, mouse lying on its side is the uh, SMA mouse. Um, the other two, the control and the SMN1 treated mouse are sitting up. Um, and so that's one thing that the SMA mouse, if you knock it over on its side, it cannot right itself. And the SMN1 treated mouse was able to do that all on its own. So this um, was the proof of concept that they felt uh, they could use going forward. They then um, went on to look at monkeys. Um, because there was some idea in the mice that there was a therapeutic window, and if you didn't treat within this window, you would not have a good outcome. Uh, that proved actually not to be true in the monkeys, um, which um, goes to show that uh, you can't go right from a mouse to a, to a human. Um, and then they also um, were able to show in pigs uh, that you could keep uh, intrathecal injections in the CNS and uh, treat just that way and get, um, and get um, good results. Uh, so this was enough for the company Avexis to go on and start designing gene therapy for SMA for humans. And so they used the AAV9 vector um, and uh, put in the SMN1 gene. Um, uh, this uh, vector is able to cross the blood-brain barrier, so we don't have to do it intrathecally, unlike the ASO molecule, which uh, is unable to cross the blood-brain barrier, and one of the reasons why they designed it for the intrathecal injection. Um, the other nice thing about the AAV9 vector is that it does not integrate into the genome. It is a freestanding episome that stays into the, into the in, inside the motor neuron um, and does not integrate into the person's genome. So there's no worry that it will in, integrate in a random place and interrupt um, some important gene. And so in 2013, um, Brian Casper and Jerry Mendel were granted um, uh, a big grant from a combination of um, NIH and the families of SMA uh, to advance uh, gene therapy. Um, uh, so they uh, treated 15 uh, type 1 infants using um, uh, IV uh, administration of the gene therapy and published their landmark paper in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2017, showing that they were able to um, ameliorate the phenotype using gene therapy. So if we looked at that paper, um, the first three patients that they had to dose were in cohort one. This was a safety dosage um, that the FDA mandated. It was a lower than efficacious dose, but this is the CHOP and TEND here, and you can still see that the CHOP and TEND scores are going up the, the um, better than uh, in SMA patients where they always are declining. <laughs> 
Um, if you look at the second cohort, which is uh, 12 additional patients, you can see that um, by the CHOP and TEND, uh, all of the patients except for one uh, had scores that, you know, were continuing to go up, up, up. Um, and in the paper, they report that 11 of the 12 patients were able to sit unassisted for at least 10 seconds, uh, nine for 30 seconds, uh, 11 achieved head control, nine could roll over, two were able to crawl and pull to stand, stand independently and walk independently. The two that were uh, able to walk and stand independently were treated much earlier than um, all the other uh, 10, 10 patients. Um, uh, this is in direct contrast to the natural history where no type 1 patients ever achieved any of those milestones and many of the type 1s uh, never learned to speak where uh, many of the 11 of the 12 patients were able to speak. So this was quite exciting. They moved on to a phase two trial, um, but in the meantime, they went to the FDA in just May of this year. Um, they were able to get approval for uh, gene therapy for spinal muscular atrophy only for type one. Um, and the, the molecule is called Zolgensma, and um, uh, it, it is being used in the clinic uh, today uh, for patients with type one. Um, things that we uh, know that were serious side effects uh, were uh, liver injury uh, in some of the children. The liver enzymes became elevated, so currently children are pre-treated with steroids to protect the liver, uh, and they watch the liver enzymes uh, to make sure they don't get too high. Um, we also know uh, that um, they have to have the titers of the AAV vector tested, um, and if they're too high, uh, they would not be uh, tried on, on Zolgensma. Um, it's for children who are age uh, two and under, and they do an IV infusion ther therapy. We have been using it at Children's Hospital. Um, we are part of the phase two, three trials. Um, the type one uh, trial, uh, the phase two, three was called STRIVE. Um, that's the one uh, along with uh, Dr. Mendel's initial trial that was approved by the FDA. Uh, we're still participating in uh, STRONG, which looks at type two patients. And instead of using an IV administration, it's using an intrathecal administration. Um, and then there's another trial called SPRINT, where they're looking at pre-symptomatic infants. Um, I believe that we have between eight and 10 patients on Zolgensma right now, and um, you know all of the patients are doing well, meeting motor milestones uh, that uh, they had not been able to meet based on their clinical phenotypes. So there are a lot of other drugs in the pipeline. This is a table from 2015, and I'm sure there are more um, since it's a little bit old. You can see two of these molecules were already approved by the FDA, but there are a lot of other ideas out there. Um, and as we talked about before, um, to coming at this disease uh, from very different angles. Um, we've already seen successes in five and six, um, and we're also um, looking um, for uh, several other avenues, uh, amplification of the SMN protein product, looking to bolster the muscles, protecting the neurons that are still there to try to prevent them from dying off. Um, so a couple uh, that stand out to us at Children's Hospital are the PTC Roche Pharmaceuticals Oral uh, SMN2 Splicing Modifier. So this is a, sort of a oral version of the Spinraza drug. Um, it started off uh, a molecule R0688524, um, but unfortunately this was called the moonfish. Uh, it didn't make it past the phase one safety studies. When they um, escalated the dosage, they, they showed that this uh, drug call, caused retinal toxicity. Um, and so this was abandoned. Um, they took it back to the lab, they redesigned the molecule, and now it's called RG7916 or Rizdiplam. Um, and it has come back uh, for phase one, looks good. Moving on to phase two, 
and phase three trials. Um, in type one SMA, it's called firefish. In type two and three, it's called sunfish. And then they actually even have a version called jewelfish, where there's um, ages two to 60, and you can be on other medications. So you can have done spin rasa um, first, and then uh, have a washout period, and then go um, into the jewel fish study if you would like. Um, so obviously an oral administration is much preferable to an LP, um, but you do, and you do have systemic distribution if you're taking an oral medication. And so this, um, lends itself to off-target uh, things that may be affected from missing at the SMN1 uh, protein, since we do know that it is ubiquitously expressed. Um, but these also can have disadvantages. The systemic distribution means that there can be more side effects. And, you know, clearly because an earlier modification of this um, drug showed retinal toxicity. It is one of the things that they are looking at very carefully uh, and the kids actually have retinal exams uh, multiple times during the clinical trial. Um, but we are seeing good um, good uh, results with this with this molecule. Another uh, thing that stands out to us is a company called Scholar Rock. They have a molecule called SRK015. Um, it, it's uh, the Topaz trial. This is an inhibitor of myostatin. So this has nothing to do with the SMN1 or the SMN2 gene. It actually is focusing on the muscles. Uh, myostatin inhibits muscle growth if you shut it off, but potentially you'll turn on muscle growth and you can bolster the muscles and um, hopefully in um, patients, um, you know, replace some of the muscle that may have been lost or atrophied over time. And it's actually um, the first co-therapy that we're seeing because in this trial, you can be on Spinraza and still participate in the Topaz trial. Um, the advent of all these therapies has been wonderful for carrier screening. Although the American College of Medical Genetics has long since 2008 recommended that there, um, for any uh, couple of childbearing age, they consider doing SMA testing because it's so common for, to be a carrier. Uh, we could not get ACOG to go along with that. Um, they thought it was too much work. Um, but luckily, with the advent of Spinraza, um, ACOG came on board um, because there was a, now a treatment to be offered to, to families who had pregnancies with uh, affected with SMA. Uh, so in 2017, ACOG mandated that all pregnant women should also be offered SMA carrier screening. This has also allowed us to pursue newborn screening. Uh, in Massachusetts, we started in 2018. I think currently there are about 13 states that either have started newborn screening or are uh, ramping up to do newborn screening for SMA. The test looks only for the homozygous deletion in exon 7, so you do miss 5% of patients that are the compound heterozygotes. Um, in Massachusetts, if you have a positive newborn screen, you're referred to an SMA center, um, and then you have repeat testing to look for the SMN1 gene testing, confirm it, and then get a copy number of SMN2 um, because the newborn screen does not test for the copy number. Uh, we try to get this done within the first uh, month of life to get children on therapy, and now we actually have two options. We can give them Spinraza or Zolgensma, depending on uh, what the family would like. So we do still think that multidisciplinary approach is the best for patient care, um, even uh, with all the therapies out there. Uh, our clinic is multidisciplinary. A patient will come in and see um, all these disciplines at one time. Um, we do know that nutrition is critical to uh, helping uh, children with, uh, with it. You know, pulmonary and respiratory functions are important. Uh, bracing, surgeries, um, spinal fusions, we still uh, see the need to do that in some of the families. And so um, having all these things uh, at one clinic is very helpful to the families. Um, and we follow uh, approximately 100 families in our specialty clinic um, at Children's Hospital. So if you're going to have a dilemma, having two therapies to offer families is a good dilemma to have. Um, we do know that um, more um, 
therapies are coming out there and this is testing some of the paradigms that we use in genetics. Um, so asymptomatic patients are not usually offered testing, uh, but once we make a diagnosis in the family, um, now if there are siblings, it is worthwhile to test them because they may not have manifested yet depending on their age and um, we could get them on uh, a drug therapy as we know that uh, pre-symptomatic treatment of patients has a much better outcome than in um, asymp than symptomatic patients. Uh, we also know that um, uh, all of our paradigms on how we classify patients is sort of uh, falling by the wayside um, because we're not able to say sitters and standers and walkers uh, because we're trying to test as many children early on and treat them prenatally, uh, I'm sorry, not prenatally, pre-symptomatically, and um, this would not allow us to know whether an SMN2 copy number is going to be a type 1 or a type 2, or an SMN3 copy number is going to be a type 2 or a type 3. Um, so this could mean that if someone is a type 3 and they won't have onset till, say, 10 years, you're treating them when they're a child. The medications are very costly. Um, we don't know the long-term effect of many of them. Uh, this is all controversial things that we're sort of uh, getting uh, to, uh, to, to think about uh, now that we're working um, uh, with things, uh, with all of these drugs. Um, and uh, uh, a lot of people feel that we should go uh, like the cancer therapy paradigm using combinations, things that are synergistic. For example, the Spinraza works on SMN2 and the uh, gene therapy works on SMN1. If you combine them together, will you get a better outcome? And these are all things that still need to be studied. Um, we are getting to this point in the clinic. We're seeing patients who are switching therapies, going from Spinraza to Zolgensma. We're having patients who are on Spinraza and then joining into the Topaz trial using combination therapies. This is all uncharted territory for us, and we're learning as we go along with these families. It is a very exciting time to be working on uh, research in SMA and with the families. Uh, we finally have tears of joy in clinic versus tears of sorrow and that there's nothing that can make your day like um, having a mom tell you that their eight-year-old child with type 2 SMA was able to hug them back for the first time ever after starting Spinraza therapy. So it's very exciting um, and I hope you've learned something today. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Alicia. That was a great, uh, great, great presentation. Um, if you guys have any questions, just enter them in the questions dashboard. Um, and let me see, we do have one question. So, and the question is, in counseling expectant parents who one parent is found to be an SMA carrier and the other has negative findings, looking at Bayesian analysis, what is the likelihood that the negative partner is a zero to genotype carrier, given family history is uninformative? Uh, I would have to do the bays out on that, and uh, um, um, but that would be exactly how we would uh, treat them. We would do that Bayesian analysis, especially if uh, we couldn't find anyone else in the family who was a three a three uh, copier, or uh, sometimes we can't get that covered by insurance. Although now the carrier testing um, has be, be become much more uh, available to families. Um, but I could do that math out for you and send it to you. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. We can send a question to you in the, and we'll have it answered that way. I'm not very good at um, basic analysis on the fly. <laughs> Sorry. <yeah. laughs> Neither can I. That would be a great thing to do. Um, it doesn't look like we have any more questions, but we have about a minute. Um, so. Well, in the meantime, in case there are any other questions, I just want to tell you we have our next Educate Next on November 1st, uh, and it's misattributed parentage as an anticipated finding during clinical genomic sequencing, uh, and it's with Dr. Joe, Josh Steinman. Um, so if you want to sign up for that, that is what's coming up next. And let's see. 
I think we have another question here. So, Council uh, Marriott looks at SNP to refine carrier risk for people with two copies of the, of SMN1. Do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, can you repeat that question? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the Just first. I guess Council and Marriott looks at SNP to refine carrier risk for people with two copies of SMN1. And do you have any thoughts about that? They look for SNP. Oh, for it's at a SNP. I'm sorry, Council. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to read these things very, and look at a SNP to refine carrier risk for people with two copies of SMN1. I don't know if you're familiar with it. There is a SNP in Exxon 7. Um, uh, that's one of the the differences uh, that can cause a milder phenotype. Um, we definitely uh, have seen that. Um, it uh, is because it enacts a, a splicing enhancer. Um, uh, and so we have definitely seen that and it can refine the risk. Um, uh, I'd be interested in see what how how council uh, does the math on that to see what the 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 risk that they then change to, um, but I do know that it can give a mild, more mild phenotype. Um, it's not something that we take into account when we're doing treatment trials, um, and usually patients who have the SNPs are not actually uh, in the trials, uh, so that uh, so that it doesn't skew results. Um, uh, but there has been. Um, uh, one specific SNP uh, that is in Exxon 7 that has uh, been shown to cause a more mild phenotype in patients. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And I think that is it. So thank you so much, Alicia, and thank you everybody for joining us today.